Yo! Okay, let's see if this is working. If you can hear me and the text is visible and stuff like that, just yell in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll kick this off. We're doing Perlin noise stuff today, which is going to be awesome. So, let's see. Yo! Hey! Good to see you, man. We're fine. Yeah, this is going to be cool. I, I've been like actually really looking forward to doing Perlin, like tearing apart Perlin noise. I've just been playing with it this week, I'm trying not to get too into it. So it's uh, fairly. <laughs> can't hear me over the Perlin noise. Truth. It's ringing. All right. Okay. Let's uh, let me switch my controls over to this machine and we'll kick off. Okay. So last week we looked at the hashing functions, and so now uh, I'm actually getting distracted by a tiny red box on OBS. So I'm gonna get rid of that. <laughs> hey, Ferris. Yeah. Fuck you. It's still me. Um, still hair. Still parens and other stuff. Uh, yeah, last week we did the hashing functions, so we've got a source of randomness that's bounded within a nice range now, and we know how that works, which turned out to be simple and stuff. So um, let's just, yeah, let's get into Perlin noise. So as before, we've got this Fraggle project, which is, again, like a tiny shader toy. It's knocked together very quickly. And so right now what we have is color responding to mouse position and clicking. And over here we have, um, for those who weren't with us last time, um, these, these are normal functions that run on the CPU. They start with defun. There's functions that start with defun G, they run on the GPU. And they can be used just as normal functions called from other GPU functions. Or down here, when you define a pipeline, you can say, hey, this function is going to be used as a vertex stage, or this function can be used as the fragment stage. So this is the uh, GPU function called Fraggle Quadfrag, amazing name, uh, that takes a vector as its primary argument. You don't have to specify all the uniforms because that would be super annoying. So yeah, we're going to go from here. And uh, yeah, for a start, let's just bring up some Perlin noise. In fact, this file is going to get crowded, so I'm going to take this fragment shader elsewhere. It's just foo.lisp. And oh! I've got an alert for a Windows update. This is a really convenient time. Should we restart now? No, fuck off. Pick a time. Pick a time like, oh, how about tomorrow? Thank you. Jesus, okay. Hopefully that's the only screw up. Let's have a look. Jump back to this machine and <laughs> Ew, package fraggle. Okay, let's make sure this is actually doing something. And we've got red, and that's horrible. Let's make some pearly noise. Taking the UV, and that also looks nasty, so let's make it white. And that's very low res, so let's scale the UVs. And let's take this from the minus one to one range to the zero to one range. Cool, now we're set up. See what's happening over there. Hey, Dreyfus! Darifus. Darius? I'm so good with names. This is why I don't remember them, because I can't pronounce them in the first place. Yeah, I, w I will have to, Shimera, I will have to disable, <laughs> disable update. I don't use the Windows machine, like, that often, except to do streams, so it's just, yeah, I try and ignore it as much as possible. Yeah, I mean, I probably should stay vaguely up to date, given the security stuff, but... We shall see. We shall see. Right, so like last time, we're going to go and jump to the definition of our Perlin noise function, which is the 2D one up here. And we're going to take this back to our file, recompile it, and now we should be using this one. And just to test that we are actually using it, we're going to return just one. We can see that that had an effect, so we're definitely compiling from this function. And now we can start pulling it apart. And I mean, just straight off the bat, what I can see is we have a hashing function up here. It's a little different from our last one in that it's a different implementation. This is, um, okay, so we got all those noise functions and they're really cool descriptions and everything from a guy called Brian Sharp. And he wrote uh, just a really nice 
um, GLSL noise library. And um, this is one of the ones in there, and it's a, like he has his own fast hashing function, and he has variants that return two or three or four random numbers per corner. And this one returns two, so we're gonna need two for something. And from the back of my mind, I'm remembering that Perlin noise is gradient noise. We'll go and look at how it's set up in a minute. Um, and so it's very likely these random, two random numbers are gonna be our gradient. And again, because it's Lisp, when we return multiple values, um, we use multiple value bind to bind the two values that came out of here to variables. So we'll, we'll come back to this in a second. Let's just detour over to the browser and let's have a look at Perlin noise. So it's a gradient noise, uh, which means there's gradients of points and we're interpolating between them. As far as I know, I actually haven't read that. Maybe I should. Let's go have a look at what gradient noise is. Noise commonly used for a procedural texture. Da, 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 da. Often confused with value noise. Well, I won't confuse it with it because I don't know what value noise is. Um, creating a lattice um, of gradients. And then there's dot producting and interpolation. Yeah, that, that just sounds like... Oh, the first known implementation of gradient noise function was Perlin noise. Okay. So yeah, that's why that sounds like a description of Perlin noise. So the details of the algorithm. Yeah, the idea is that there is some grid and then the corners, the points on the grid, the corners of the squares, we're gonna create random gradients. We're gonna do some dot producting apparently, and then we're gonna interpret those gradients together. And that, what, what that does that's nice is it gives us kind of this random stuff that we've got going over here, but the random features are, are the same size roughly. They're the same size, which is controllable. So because we control the grid, we control the size of the feature, and that becomes really useful when you want to start composing noise together and all that kind of stuff. So that's cool. Um, so there's going to be a grid. There's going to be dot producting. Um, so given this, so we take a point that's going to be like our UV. We're going to find which cell it's in, a point within that cell. And then for all the corners from that cell, we're going to make a distance vector. Okay, so just a vector coming into that point. And then we dot product that with the gradients that we generated. This is gonna be interesting. And then what happens? Yeah, then we're gonna interpolate stuff together using smooth step apparently. Okay, we'll look at that. And then they have this pseudocode here. Now, the, one of the things I remember reading was that Perlin's implementation was excellent, very, very cool, um, but it was very much optimized for CPU usage and not for the GPU, which makes this implementation that we're going to take apart a little more interesting because, again, it's got to run fast. So let, let's just dive into it. Let's have a look at this. Okay, so first off, we're taking uh, UVs to a point, um, which is a vector 2, and we are flooring it. And this is a terrible name. Like, Pi is going to really piss me off if I have to look at that all evening because I'm going to be thinking about the wrong thing. So this is going to be like we're taking the floor, so it's the grid chord probably. So let's replace pi with grid chord everywhere. So pi pi pi. And let's move this down because we have to have big fonts so we can stream stuff. Um, let's move a couple of things down to the next line. And we're gonna just space this out. <laughs> Weird code no friends, damn right. It's unacceptable. Whereas, like, we need like 19 closing parens just hanging off. Right. Um, okay. So let's put some space here. And this pf pf min one is again. This is I guess this is point float. If pi was probably point integer, and so pf is point float, and point float minus one. That's really. That's kind of annoying. So what we've got, ah, I've got actually got, I've got a thing to doodle with today. So let's, uh, let's try that out. Okay, so we're gonna have a, a point, some random UV, and then we're gonna have a grid chord, which is gonna be this one up here. And then we're subtracting, we're packing 
the x and y twice into this vector 4, and then we're subtracting the grid chord, which is the integer version, and the grid chord plus 1, which means we're going to get, oh man, I am not built for drawing straight lines. We're going to get this one, and we're going to get, no, this is too far. I won't be able to draw this. Go on, you wiggly bastard. There we go. And we're going to get that vector. So, to me, this is top left and bottom right. So, I think I want to call that variable something related to that. Um, so, let's replace this with... Whoa. Yeah, let's copy that and replace it with... It's UV because it's a point within... We're going to have vectors coming in. So, UV vectors, I guess. Uh, top left, top right. This is not a great name, but it's it's short enough that we can have it in the stream. And I can't do properly descriptive names because they'll just take up too much space. And it should be enough to remind me what's going on. Cool, so we've got two vectors. And let's turn off the scribble mode and switch back to this. And then we are getting our two random numbers. And then we're, again, so those random numbers from the function are between 0 and 1. And we want our gradient to go in, like, any direction. So he's subtracting almost 0 0.5. Oh, yeah, something I'm going to explain. Um, you'll see that some of my numbers in this shader are as strings. And the reason is that um, sometimes in the shader programming, the number that, you're, that you have in the code is actually, it's a floating point number, but they're after the bit pattern. And so it's a really precise floating point number. Now, I don't trust that the implement, like I don't have to go through Lisp's approximation, like floating point numbers, and then convert that to GLSL because there's some kind of truncation there. And I just, I just don't trust it. So if I want to write a number exactly um, as it will appear in the GLSL, I write it like this. And so if we see when I, uh, if I just do pull G on Perlin noise, I don't have to say which Perlin noise I'm pulling, back two. And let's move this over here for a second. You'll see that that big old number here is exactly as I wrote it in the, um, in the Lisp code. And that's because of that string, because any other floating point representation is going to truncate that. Anyway, detour aside, they're just floats. Cool, so we are minusing almost 0 0.5. I don't know why it's almost. There's probably a reason. If anyone can guess that reason, please shout it in the comments, because in the, in the chat, um, because I have no idea. But anyway, we're going to end up with a vector that's between, uh, let's write that down, actually. Like, these are going to be... Uh, between minus 0.5 and um, 0.5, somewhere in that range. Let's do oops, that. Okay, and then we've got this is where it starts getting meaty. Like straight away, th this big number down here, I don't like. I don't like this big fat constant. I don't. I, I'm not sure what that's for yet. I guess it'll make sense soon enough. But, um... Okay, so we know after the lattice stuff, yeah, right, magic numbers. Um, and... Oh, actually, I, I can go and look at the... Let's go and look at the GLSL code for this. Um, I have it around here somewhere. GPU noise, GPU noise, and Perlin 2D. Okay, so we're back to our weird code without parens again. And yeah, here we go. Let's take this comment. And this optionally scale things to the zero to one to what like minus one to one range. And this is what he's doing with it. Okay, it's one over the square root of zero point five. Also, I have no <laughs> idea why that number, but um, we'll see. We'll see. Um, yeah, but I don't. <laughs> Magic numbers are all over cryptography. Yeah, I don't want to encrypt my graphics. I just want nice noise. I know it is related to hashing and all that, but, but we'll see. Um, 
Okay, so we know the step after the gradients is meant to, sorry, after, yeah, generating the gradient, which is here. Well, this, these are the numbers we're going to be using for the gradient. We know that we're going to be doing, doing dot producting, but the only dot producting I see is right at the end, which is weird. Um, but what we're doing here is we are multiplying grad x with itself and then grad y with itself. So this is, again, he's, he's packing things in vector fours and the result is going to be a, is just one float. So he's doing <laughs> multiple things at once here. Let's see what's going on. So he's got... Um, oh yeah, so it's two numbers per corner. And there's four corners, so there's eight numbers. So hash x is going to have some, is going to have, yeah, four of those numbers in hash y is going to have four numbers in. But which ones? The, the fact that it's grad x and y, yeah, is that just, like, because pi was a bad name as well. Like, x could be all of the x's, and this could be all of the y's, or this could just be a and b. Like, it's not super clear. But what's, what does interest me is normally when I see like two vectors, like if you take a vector and dot product it with itself, you get um, its length squared. And then if you were to divide by the length, you would you would have, um, see, sorry, no, it, yeah, you'd get the length squared, but then you're, and then you're adding it to this one. Mm. It just feels like that, I mean, there has to be a dot product around here and it feels like this is going to be related. One second while I check something over here. And cool. Back to business. Right, so. Um, let's Yeah, so if he's, we've got inverse square root. Why is he taking the inverse square root of that? So he's multiplying the inverse square root with these additions here. And, top, oh, wait a second. I've got this vector name wrong as well. Top, I said it was a bad name. Okay, so it's top left, bottom right. Let's try that again. Um, Okay, so, so let's just take one component of this. Let's, so if it was the first one, we're taking a random number, we're multiplying it by itself, um, and then we're adding it to some other random number. So this is like X and Y's. Um, yeah, so it, like sum of components squared, and then you normally take the square root, and that gives you length. This, this feels related. I'm, I'm gonna go with these are, um, because, right, because we need four gradients, right? We need a gradient for each corner of the lattice. So um, this will be like, let's get the doodler out again. Um, move that over there. The grad X is going to have um, all the X's for the gradients. One, two, three, four. And grad Y is going to have all the Y's. Y, 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 Y. One, two, three, four. So in the end, these are going to be our vector two gradients. He's just packed them in two different uh, float fours so that you can start doing operations between them nice and fast. So let's turn off the doodle again and get back to this. So he's Multiplying this column with, yeah, okay, so it's, yeah, it's distance, it's distance squared, got to be. So it's sum of the, yeah, sum of the components squared, and then, oops, new software, stay. Okay, that's not going to show, okay, we'll, um, we'll leave it on doodle mode for now. If he takes the, Oh no, I see, I'm reading this wrong. This is the problem. Like inverse square root to me, this is, this always fucks me over. Um, and, it, and it's a really stupid mistake to make, but it's just how I read it. 
when I think of the inverse of an operation, I think the other way. So like inverse square root would be what? Square? But it's it's not. Like, I, oh, fuck, I, it bugs me how often I forget this. The inverse square root of something is 1 over the square root of x. So the result of this is going to be 1 over the lengths, if I can spell, of all these vectors. Because he's squaring them first, and then he's adding those components together, and then he's square rooting and taking 1 over. So we've got, yes, that's, that's exactly what this is. Okay, so I'm a bit happy with that now. This, let's actually move this out to its own, to its own thing, because this, this is going to get confusing otherwise. We're going to move this to its own variable. Let's get rid of all those drawings for a second. Right, so this feels like something to do with, yeah, so this is 1 over lengths, and grad Let's do 1 over lengths, compile that, and grad x isn't grad x, it's, oops, it's gradient x's, oops, if I could type again, gradient x's, and y is gradient y's. All right. And it's still, I'm just going to check it's still running. If I just, if I call CLS, I'm clearing the screen. Um, and so if the graphic stays after that, it means we're still live coding. Everything's still running. I haven't crashed it yet. Hacky, but it works. So then we're multiplying the lengths by something. Now we know, I'm going to get my doodles back. Again. We know that we have a point. Come on, computer. We have a point somewhere in this square, and we've got this vector and this vector with random colors stored in, what is it, here and here, inside this one vector 4, which is green. Um, so here he's taking x and z, x and z, which is going to be, let's, if we do this. This is x of u, v, t, l, b, r. Oh, what a name. This is y. This is z. Yeah. And this is w. So he's... All right, so then... One of the, um, the steps in the Wikipedia article was that um, you're going to take the distance vectors from the corners down to this point. So we need not only these two, but we also need this one and this one. But we've got all the information we already need. Uh, oh man, sorry Ferris. Hey, um, I'm actually gonna check my upload as well, make sure it's not coming from my end. Thanks for stopping by anyway, really cool to see you. Um, Okay, just checking the Twitch status stuff, which is saying not much. Come on, give me a status. Okay, I've got a few blips. Basically, how is this coming through to you guys? Is this stream okay or is it, like, is it, basically, is it on Ferris end? Cool. Hey, Rick, good to see you, man. Thanks, Bob Dupin. All right, we'll keep going then. So we need these four distance vectors. Darius, thanks man. Quality is fab, it's, oh, it's totally on it. Okay, Ferris is saying, that's, that's sweet. Cheers, Vid. Oh, see you, Shimera. Good luck. See you around. Um, we need, which computer am I on? I'm on this computer, yes. We need all these four vectors, and we've got these two, which means we can totally reconstruct these other ones, right? So uh, this one here is just x, w. This one is z, y. And then we've already got the other two. So that's what's going on down here. Like, let's get the...
Oh, fuck. I totally just paused the stream. I was on the wrong computer. And I pressed pause, and on that machine, pause, because I've got this set up really sensibly. On one computer, pause is um, start drawing, and on the other one, pause is uh, stop streaming. <laughs> Which is smart. So let's, uh, right, I'm definitely fucking idiot. Okay, I'm definitely over here. So I don't know where I hit that button, but <laughs> we're going to get these four vectors. And so that's what we're looking at down here. So X and Z. Um, are the the two X components. XZ, XZ. So these are. Um, yeah, this one here and this one here. Those are the X uh, components and W uh, sorry, Y and W are these ones here. And then he's multiplying them with excess. Oh yeah, okay, so we've got this one over lengths here. Then he's gonna take the x's um, and multiply them with these x's. He's taking the y's and multiplying with these y's. And then he's multiplying by one over the lengths, which is the same as <laughs> uh, dividing by the lens. This is the dot product. This is totally the dot product. You're taking your your yeah, your your multiplying work. I am terrible of explaining this right now. Let's just go and get Wikipedia to do it. Dot product. We all know how how useful all of those are. <laughs> yeah, the dot product is of two vectors is the sum of the components multiplied together. So you multiply x by x, y by y, z by z, w by w, add them all together, that's your dot product. Okay, and that's what he's doing here. He's adding the x's, sorry, multiply, sorry ah, multiplying the x's, multiplying the y's, adding them all together, dividing them by the lengths. Um, and so this, grand results, is a vector of four dot products. Why don't we even do that? Uh, grand results is dot products. Du, du, du. We compile, everything's still fine. Okay. So now we get to the weirdy number. And this is going to need coffee. One second. Mm. Streaming the wonderful sounds of hairy men drinking slurpy drinks. Right. Um, it's a constant. It's not related to the direction these... Like... It's four numbers and they're being scaled an equal amount. Basically, what's the longest that any one of those numbers can be. So he's multiplying it by the square root of 0 0.5. So let's just, let's look at the square root of 0 0.5. It's 0 0.77. So that has to be the longest that he, that they can be like, like, because if it's the, the highest case is it's going to be one. It can't be lower than minus one or greater than one. So for it to be one, we, yeah, we have to divide it by the square root. He, yeah, basically he thinks he, it can't be longer than this number because otherwise multiplying it by this would make it higher than one. So if we multiply 0.7 blah, 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 by 1.4 doodly do, we get very nearly one. So if this was any bigger, we'd be off above one, and that's outside the range. So we've just learned from this, the highest number of, that can be in one of these dot products is this. How? How does he know that? That means that Okay, so he's got these lengths. 
We know that the grad X and grad Ys, the highest they can be is 0 0.5. And we're getting lengths here. Hmm. So the biggest this could be is 0 0.5, 0 0.5 times, and like, what's the worst case vector in here? Like the worst case would be the dot was right down in the corner because then this vector would be one, one. So 0 0.5 times one would be 0 0.5, 0 0.5 times one would be 0 0.5. Add them together, so the highest number that can be in this whole chunk, whoops, made my mouse, this whole chunk here is one. Um, and and then he's timesing it by the length. Well, I did, that, that could actually make sense, right? So if we have, if the the longest it can be is one by one, then what's the length of a vector that's one by one? So we go one, one, and then we say length of that is 1.4, 1, 4, 2, 1, which is this. And so we're saying this, the biggest number this can be is 1, and th that means the biggest length that this can be is 1.4, and so it's Dividing one by one point, ba -da -ba 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 -da, which is 0 0.7. Yes. Okay. So that that's it. That's where this comes from. Is that the worst possible case? Is that, um, yeah. Is that this is 0 0.5, and the lens, yeah, and then the lens would be 0. Yeah, 0 0.7. Uh, I'm not entirely sure I've got that down right, and I'm sorry if that was just. Complete waffle, but I'm feeling like I have an idea at least where this weird number comes from. And so rather than understand it entirely, I'm gonna move on, if that's okay with you folks, because I wanna find out, because we're getting down to blending now, which is stuff we can graph. This is like tricky because normally, like last episode we were able to use uh, the graph function loads, um, but it's a bit harder here because the numbers we want to graph, like I could show you, if I say we wanted to graph, I don't know, say uh, graph sum lambda x float. And let's just say it was, yeah, the sine of x over uv. Whoops, uv is undefined. Oh yeah, it's called p here, isn't it? There's no applicable method for the GLSL function Okay. Um, oops. Okay. That is hard to look at. Oh yeah, this is going to turn a this is going to turn a vec four. That's that's the problem. I will be able to prove the point. Oof. It's actually quite hard to see. Basically, one of the, the, the problem we would have if we were trying to graph in this function is all of the values that we're interested in are here, and I can't, I don't support lexical closures yet in uh, my compiler. Mifanio, gotta go. Uh, watch the rest on YouTube. Take care, man. I'll see you. Uh, I'll see you later. Yeah, we can't, we can't um, capture surrounding uh, variables in in first class functions at the moment, because we get closures. Technically the compiler could do it, but I haven't implemented that yet. So unfortunately this episode is not as visual as I'd like it to be, but at least we can still fiddle around with some numbers. Now, Quintic, this is a blending function, and this is something we can actually have a look at. So if we go down here and say graph, graph, sure, graph, um, Quintic over UV. And it doesn't know which Quintic function I am talking about. We need a Quintic one that takes a float. And I'm going to get rid of those doodles a second. Okay. And so all this is, is yeah, is a function that starts off flat, 
and curves up. It's a, it's a, a classic S function. In fact, this is, I believe, exactly the same as smooth step. So if we just say graph um, lambda, we'll do the graphing down here, float smooth step x from 0 to 1, uv, we can barely see the difference. If I do this from 0.2 uh, to 0.8, we'll actually see that there is another function there, u. And um, is that really smooth step to, to, to 0.8? That's kind of weird. I'm curious now, one second. Let's get the range from minus one to one in the x-axis and minus one to one in the y-axis. Let's tell graph to graph over this range and see what we've got. Okay. Oh yeah, totally, because I've forgotten the syntax for smooth step. That's the problem. Um, you specify the range first and the x value last. Okay, now we're, now we're talking. There we are. So we can see it's not only a very similar function, let's remove this range again. Um, Quintic is exactly the same as smooth step. No, it's not. Oh, I've got this wrong. Oh shit. What's Quintic then? I'm thinking of Hermite. One second, if we change this to Hermite. Hermine, is it Hermine or Hermite? Hermine. There we are. Now they're exactly the same. Okay. I am talking out of my ass. Okay, so test before you yak. Right. Hermine is an S curve um, that is exactly the same as smooth step zero one. Why was that in my head? I think it was I think it was the interpolation function that Perlin originally used in Perlin noise. I'm not sure now. Let's go back to Perlin noise again. Interpolation. Oh, they're interpolating with love. That's boring. That's going to look nasty as well. Um, do, they even, do they mention that? That sounds terrible. Oh, yeah, here we go. Look. Um, yada, yada, yada. An example of a function that interpolates between a value and a grid node. Smooth step between 0 and 1, which is Hermine. Um, for reasons, we're using Quintic. And I'm not sure what that reason is. Except that that's what was in the other library. So let's stick with that. So we've got a curve, basically. And it's flat at the top and flat at the bottom. Um, which should mean everything joins together nice. So we're creating that curve. And then we are blending. Hmm. We're packing a vector with... One, with, with that curve and one minus that curve. So we've just got, yeah, got a ramp going in two directions. And then we are dot producting our dot products. So yeah, because the original function said interpolate the dot products between the four corners of your grid cell. And so Oh, what are they doing here? I think I want to pull this code out and play with it in its own function. Because this is a bit weird. B fungi weird. Which is going to take UV. Oh, come on, Chris. Type vec2. And what are we going to do with it? We're going to say quintic. And this, okay, UV, yeah, we'll just do one UV quintic. So it's going to be X of UV. Let's try that. Let's just see what we get to start with. So call the weird function with the UV. Okay, yeah, so we, we get that gradient. This is the S curve we had before. In fact, we might want to blend that with the graph. For Quintic UV. Oops, and again, I need to remember my types. And that 
Oh yeah, that blend takes a vector 4. Okay, so here's our gradient, and here's the actual curve, because gradients are hard to look at. Um, and then, he's making this in the x-axis, and the inverse of that, 1 minus that, for the y-axis. What's he doing with it? So it's Z and X again. So we've got these patterns, and this patterns normally mean like... So he's got two curves, and he's multiplying them together. If we take two curves and just multiply them together, let's, let's do what they're doing. So they're doing 1 minus quintic. I don't know why I wrote this out, because I can just graph, I could graph weird, couldn't I? Can I do that? Yeah, if I change this to be a float, and x of uv, that. Oh. oh, maybe I've confused myself now. Weird, it's taking a float here. I thought graph was going to take, it's going to give it a float as well. Have I got that wrong? Multiple external, oh yeah, we've got multiple functions, so I need to specify the type again. Chris will never learn. Okay, so We've got weird, which is the quintic of x, or 1 minus x. And then we're going to multiply them together. So what does that look like? Oh, yeah. Okay, so we get a pulse. That makes sense. So yeah, one curve minus the other. This is quite low. So I mean, it maxes out at... Kind of interesting, isn't it? I wonder what it maxes out at. Maxes out at some value down here, 0 point something, 0 point 0.3. Um, but that's what he's doing here by multiplying blend two together. He's creating, yeah, he's creating a ramp, a nice S curve. He's packing that S curve with its complementary curve. And then he's multiplying them together, which is getting kind of a pulse in both dimensions, I guess. And then he's using that to interpolate. If you multiply, if you dot product those first numbers with this ramp, it's going to multiply each component by the respective part of the ramp. And so, yeah, you're going to get you're, you're going to get a blend together. Okay, so that's quite a that's a, like a parallel way of blending those things together. I, I wish I what I really need to do is I need to add. 3D graphs, because this would be nicer to, <laughs> to visualize if it was a, if it was a, like a 2D graph, because this bit here where he does quintic of X and Y, yeah man, like if this was UV, like if we change this back to a vector 2 again, and then we say quintic, have I got quintic to find for Vector 2? Oh, I do. There's quintic up here. Vector 2, 3, and 4. Nice. So I should be able to do quintic of UV. Um, and then I would be able to call it down here, called weird with the UV. And we would get, yeah, we've got a two-dimensional ramp here, but it's, it's hard to see, like with colors. The human eye is just not really good at discerning what's going on. I mean, you, yeah, right. Pump the pimp. Three D doodles, right, man? I need, I need some three D doodling. Um, I need a three D graph. I saw a really nice implementation on Shader Toy, but it didn't have a license, and I'm really not comfortable with, like, because I would be almost directly copying that code. Um, 
And so I'm not really comfortable with just going and nabbing that. I've reached out to the guy on Twitter, haven't heard anything yet, but if he comes back, because it was really good, because it was doing, um, it was a ray marching approach, um, or distance marching or something, except it handled thin edges really well, and it handled both sides of the surface. It was just, oh, it was just right. It was really cool. So that would be nice, maybe in the future. So I, at least we, I, I, I can identify the different parts of this now. So it doesn't feel quite as revelatory as I might want, but I'm in the right ballpark at least. We've got, we've got a grid corner that comes in, like we have a, a point that comes in. And then, and that's here. Then we get to here, we take the floor of it, which gives us this here. Whoops, if I can draw that. This point here. Um, we pack it together. Um, we get, yeah, we, we calculate the vectors from here to here and from here, again with the hands, up to here. And that's packed in this. And then we go and get ourselves two random numbers for each corner. So that's some gradient that comes out here, maybe here, because it's completely random. Maybe it goes this way. Maybe it goes this way. Um, and the, it puts the, the X components of um, these random numbers. So we, in this random number, we have, sorry, in this vector, we have, two, we have four random numbers. In this one, we have four random numbers. Um, he subtracts 0.5 um, from all of them, which takes them from the range 0 to 1 to minus 0 0.5 to 0 0.5. Um, he has all the x's in this vector, so that's, um, yeah, x1, x2, x3, and x4, and all the y's in the next one, so that's y, 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 why are we, are you watching this? Don't you have better things to do? I hope not. I love Lisp. Um, and then he multiplies the, the x's with themselves. So each number is multiplied with itself because vector multiplication is component wise. So these are now all squared. And he does the same with these, which is down here. So all of these are squared as well. And he adds them together. And if you're, you're take, so you're taking the square of this plus the square of this and then you're doing the square root which is giving you the length of this vector so each one of these we get the length for da, 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 da. so length I'll just put L for these but it's the inverse square root so it's one over the length, one over the length, one over the length, one over the length. And that's one, two, three, four. And that's what's packed into this vector. And then he takes these vectors that we had packed in before in this guy and multiplies them with our columns here again and adds them together and that's doing a dot product um, yeah and then he's yeah then he's dividing by the lengths cool now yeah we're getting the dot product there so wouldn't that be so is this actually hmm, i'm starting to confuse myself now it will be the yes i think that's okay oh is it that you, He's normalizing it? Oh no, I can't get confused about this now. I had this, I'm not losing it again. Move on. This scaled back into the minus one to one range. He generates a nice quintic curve that looks nothing like that. And he takes the complementary as well. He packs them together in a vector and he uses them to interpolate the dot products together. And we get this lovely stuff. Hmm. Did that make sense to you guys? 
I, th I think I, I think I'm just about there with it. Um, it's kind of tricky because because this has been designed to be done on a GPU where uh, vector four operations are as cheap as floating single floating point operations. Everything's packed together in ways to make it as efficient as possible. Like every operation, like we're gonna do an operation on four things at a time. So it's a bit tricky. Maybe like, I see, see nothing in the chat. So maybe I'm just on my own now. This is what happens when you talk about Lisp and, uh, and maths at the same time. You end up streaming to yourself. But I think I'm vaguely okay with this now. I get a rough idea where it's coming from. Um, yeah, it, it is tricky, isn't it? Like, um, but I think, I think I could go through this a couple of times and, and feel all right about it. At least, like, what I'm happy about is like when we, um, we did the hash stuff last time, you can at least see the steps. Because the, the article claims, yes, you're going to do, like, you're going to get your distance vectors and you're going to dot product them with this and then you're going to interpolate between them. At least you can see the steps now. Because that was more confusing at first, not seeing where the dot product exactly was. And then, but using it obviously is is kind of simple. Like if I if I get back in here again and clear our doodles away and come down here, actually using this stuff isn't too bad. So we will take um, this. And we, the common way to use this noise is to sum a few of them together. So we're going to take a few octaves of noise. So we'll do one at two times, one at four times, one at eight times. Let's just start with that. And you sum them together and everything's too bright. Okay, right. Oh yeah, normally you do, I think you, we've mapped all these into the zero to one range. Oh no, I shouldn't do that yet. Let's not do that. And we can vec3 at the end. So maximum speed is 1. Let's divide this by 4 and divide this by 8. Map it into a different range. It's kind of hard to see. Divide that by two. And we can start adding in details. So if we set this to one, yeah, we can start pulling, like adjusting the contributions of the different strengths. So like if we take Perl and noise for eight, it looks roughly like this. Whoops. With, with it mapped into a sensible range. And so we see quite fine details. And the higher yeah, basically, the more frequently we sample, the higher the frequency of the noise. Yeah, point of fame, definitely like the last hash debug. Yeah, like, there's logic in there. It's not, basically, I feel like I wouldn't be able to write this myself, but at least I know, kind of, I know what the code smells like. I know where it, I know where it's vaguely coming from. So we can take noise at different octaves and add it together and the sum of that gives us something that's visually interesting so if we start putting 16 in here yeah we start getting some so that's oh no not like that um or 32 now this it, it's kind of fine shoving this in the texture and oh that's nice but this is way better if we actually put it on something 3d like a terrain so what I did earlier in the week was um, I was I, I basically I couldn't wait to play around with some other stuff. So I was um, so I made a little toy, and we'll switch over to that project now. And it's all it is is just taking these um, Perlin noise and putting it onto um, a lattice, a grid, and displacing it. So then we have a little three D terrain like thing. So let's let's go do that, and we can always revisit this one again. I'm not sure how much more insight I'm going to be able to glean out of it, and that's why I'm. Uh, let's let's restart everything quickly. So let's, because I don't trust the demo gods, I'm going to restart this. Um, because you, 
really don't need weirder bugs. I can create plenty of bugs on my own. Du, du, du. Okay, so height maps loaded. Let's go into that package. Whoops. And let's start the height map program. Okay, and then I'm going to reset data because I know I need to do that. All right, we've got a nice flat terrain. And let's go to the height map project, which is around here somewhere, and main. Okay. Right, time to do some 3D stuff. Um, we have a little bit of code to look at, but not too much. So we'll just kind of go through this so we can see how this was set up. Um, and it should only take a minute. So the first thing we've got up here is we've got a global variable for the mesh. So this, this uh, object here, we're not doing any ray march or anything like this. This is good old fashioned polygons. And there's actually a lot of them here, uh, as we'll see in a minute. So this is the object that's going to hold the stream of vertices that we're going to render. We've also defined an object for, for model space. Now, I've got a system which we might go into, depending on what you guys are interested in. Um, I have a system that allows you to create objects that represent like world space and model space for various different models, view space and then say get transform between two spaces and you get the matrix four. And so that's what this is going to be used for. And some of the code I'm going to show you is using this space system. And it works not just on the CPU, but the GPU. And it's got some cool, like, it was one of the things after making the compiler that I, I started like playing with ideas for what can we do now we've got a compiler basically. We'll come back to this. So we've got a mesh stream. This is rendering. So we're going to come back to this in a second because this is where we, where we normally are. We'll jump down to here. We've got a main loop just like we had. Basically, I copied that Fraggle project and just swapped out what was what we were rendering, basically, and what data we initialized. So we have, um, when we reset the data and we call this function, it's going to see if things are allocated and free them. So if there's already a mesh stream, it's going to go and free the data that's inside there. And then it's going to repopulate it. And the way it does that is it calls lattice GPU arrays, which is a function that returns two GPU arrays. That's just it's easier to show you. REPL. And we're going to say Nineveh, oops, Nineveh dot mesh primitives lattice. Oh, we'll do lattice C arrays to start with. And then we have to specify a couple of details like width and which is going to be let's just say 20 and the height which is going to be 20 and then the number of segments so what we're seeing over here is a grid like this and so we've got to specify how many segments this way and how many segments that way um, so we're going to say 10 segments, and for y, um, we have 10 segments. And then we're given back two um, foreign arrays. And we can do the same thing here with GPU arrays. And these contain the data for this object. And let's just go and get one. So if we get the first thing in that list, and then we say pull on it, so like we can pull um, shaders back to see their, their uh, GLSL code. We can also pull data back to get it into Lisp. So these are the vertices for that grid we just requested. And the first component here um, is, what have we got here? We've got the position, we've got the normal, and we've got the texture coordinates. And then we've just got all of those. And the second GPU array that was returned, if we just go and look at that again, this second one is the list of indices into that first GPU array. So when we make a stream, we take the data and the indices into that data. And then when we map over it, it renders stuff. And this is uh, kind of standard GL concepts. If you're not familiar with them yet, 
because I'm happy to go through those as well. But let's go back to main. So that's all we're getting there. We've got a function which returns some GPU data, and then we make a stream out of it and we shove it in that mesh stream thing that we were saying earlier. So now there's a variable called mesh stream, and it has, yeah, six million triangles. Is it six million triangles? Six million, yeah, six, yeah, that makes sense. A thousand, a thousand by a thousand, that's, yeah, a million squares. Oh yeah, it'd be a, a six million vertices, that's it, like points. So we make this mesh stream, and we reset the camera position, because we might have gone somewhere else. I've got a really terrible look around camera at the moment, which is like whenever I click, it resets. Oh, it's nasty. It snaps too. Well, like it was a, it's a hack together. We'll, we'll see that in a second. So this is setting up data. And here's a function to reposition the, and reset the position and rotation of the camera if we screw it up. And then in our main loop, it's calling step height map play every frame, which is up here. And all we do every frame is we say, hey, is the W key down? And if it is, um, we set the position of the camera to be its current position plus, and then we take the rotation of the camera and we turn that into a direction and then we add that to the current position. So it means when I go over here and press W, it moves way too fast. So let's scale that a bit. Um, we will say this is going to be a vector 3, so we can say vector 3 times some scalar. Let's say 0 0.4. So when we go backwards, it'll be really fast, but when we go forwards, it's a bit slower. Let's make it a bit slower still. It actually feels impressive when we get, get further along. Whoop, there we go. Yeah, it's a little better. And now we have to do the same to reverse. And again, the, the, the code for reverse is the same. If I press S, if that key is pressed down, then set the position of the camera to be the current position minus the direction the camera is facing. And now we're going to add our little multiply vector 3 multiplied by scalar 0.2. And now things should be, yeah, there we go. Nice and ponderous and slow. Nice. Okay, and then this bit here is saying if the left mouse button is pressed down, and this is from mouse zero because we can have many mice or many keyboards, um, then we get the um, normalized mouse position. So it's zero here to one, zero to one as a vector two, and we change the rotation of the camera based on this. We just we rotate around the y-axis and the x-axis by some amount that we tweak and then we multiply the, these are, Q is for making quaternions because the rotation of the camera is in quaternions. Um, this camera is provided by a library called Keppel Camera which is completely separate from everything else so you can use it or not use it, it's completely up to you. Uh, so again like not making engines means you have lots of lots of disparate libraries that have to kind of play nice together eventually or at least I try to make them play nice. Okay, so that's our controls, and then the actual bit where we start drawing. We say as frame, and this is a macro, and when we expand this macro, what we see is all it does is, let's uh, put the other code down here so we can see what it was originally. So this is what we had originally. We take this bit, and before it we do a clear, and after it we do a swap. So that's what we mean by a frame. Clear it at the beginning, we swap to actually show what we've drawn at the end and then everything in the middle is just the same stuff so we're going to clear and then if we've got a mesh stream which we created a second ago we're going to use this camera which is part of the camera library it just says that from my point of view basically we're going to draw um, the mesh stream using this pipeline so let's go up to that pipeline because now we finally get to the bit where we draw stuff. And this is it. We have a function we're going to use as the vertex shader, a function we're going to use as a fragment shader, and the pipeline itself that calls, that, you know, connects these all together. And what happens is that we 
draw all of the, the vertices, and then we, when we take their position, which we do here, the position of the vertex that we passed in here, we're going to add the result of calling this function multiplied by some stuff. So here we can see that all this function does is call this function and then makes it into a vector three. So we can effectively ignore this. This just takes this and makes it a vector three. And this then can be interesting. So if we say times four, let's start with one. It's hard to see if anything has actually changed. So I'm gonna whack the up number a bit and we can start to see that we're getting some modifications. So we are displacing our lattice by some amount. And it looks like quite a smooth curve because I've actually just, all I've done is there's a thousand uh, squares in this direction, and a thousand in this direction. So there's, a, there's plenty of polygons and we're just using that. In, it's a nice low tech way. We don't have to do any very much. We just draw polygons. And so what we're going to do is we're going to replace this function with any function that we like that returns a float. And that's going to be used to displace the original grid. And so for us, that means that we are going to stick Perlin noise in here. And you can barely see it made a difference. So let's do what we normally do in these kind of things and scale the UV some. And then we immediately see we've got stuff. And we can go and we're going to just fly down to the little bugger and yeah, there we go. And you'll notice it's actually got shadowing as well, like really, really dodgy shadowing. And I'll explain how that's done in a minute. It's, again, it's not, it's not a cheap way of doing it, but it does work. So that created some noise. And like we said, if we look at the top, we actually see, hey, it looks just like our textures we had before. But now we've got it in 3D. And we see one of the design features of Perlin Noise, which is each of these features, as they're called, um, are roughly the same size. So to get features of different sizes, we're going to have to start combining these things together. <laughs> Drake, there are us. Ah, I am so sorry that I keep uh, messing up your name. I don't know why I, I keep calling you uh, Dreyfus. I think I want to turn you into some character from some epic thing. Uh, Darius, sorry. I will get there. Bear with me. I am just a slow, hairy man. But thank you for saying it's beautiful. Uh, Ball Bag has asked, what's the current story on geometry shaders? Anything cool you could show? Yeah, probably. Yeah, geometry shaders work. Geometry, tessellation, all that stuff works. Um, yeah, uh, it's um, it's pretty cool. Yeah, we should do some job. Tell you what, we'll mess around with this pearly noise stuff a little, and then we'll throw uh, some geometry crap at it as well. Yeah, totally. Blending both worlds right now. It's a real sense. It's... This is going to be fun. I'd like to visualize all the normals and stuff because then we'll be able to see. Hey, actually what we could do, you know that stuff earlier that I said you couldn't graph in 3D? We've got a 3D graph here. Like we can totally stick whatever function we like in this fucker and we've got, I'm an idiot. Okay, so we'll do, we might do that later as well. Like basically yell at me to stop because otherwise I'm going to go on for a while. It's been an hour. I'm quite happy to go for another hour if it's cool with you guys because uh, we're getting, Gets the good stuff. Right, so the technique for using Perl in noise is you're meant to add stuff together. So if we take two of these functions and do one at a lower frequency, so if we just say this is the lower frequency one, it's kind of mushy. Let's, <laughs> technical term, let's times it by two. That's a little better. Times it by four. There we're talking. Right, and then we're going to add our last Perl in noise. Eh, that's a bit much. So let's divide that by 0 0.5. That's a little bit better. 0 0.3. Okay. So now we can already see this is starting to look a bit more like a terrain from games of yesteryear. Gross and awesome at the same time. Right. So then we can start stacking this. So we can do, let's do one at a slightly lower frequency and say multiply by one. Oh, that's good. Actually, I want to take that out again and look what that looks like. So, that was the original. Can we put this on it? That's kind of cool. Two? Yeah, maybe that's a bit much. 1.5. Here. Let's do that. Yeah. That's... That'll look...
cool. So this is this is how we can start composing this noise together. And we get different size features just by sampling uh, the Perlin noise function at different frequencies and adding those together with some multiplication modifiers and things to make their contribution sensible, aesthetically pleasing or whatever. Of course, there's tons of other stuff you can do with Perlin noise, but like it's it doing it with terrain is just so satisfying, especially as a kid, because I was like, I love this stuff. I love being able to like generate a terrain and things like this. And so to actually get into the function and to be able to do this without recompiling is quite nice. Well, without having to wait for a recompile. Just fly around with our terrible camera. And you might, I doubt you can see on the stream, maybe if I get really close. Nah, it looks kind of dark on the stream. Aw. But um, I can see really strong banding in our shadows, which makes perfect sense given how they're done. So let, let's, uh, let's talk about that. So... We need a normal, because it basically, if we if we don't have a nice normal here, so if I just do set it to up, we are going to get no shading. And so this function has to create a normal for us to use. And the way it does that is it takes our function that we've been creating up here and it passes it to this function here, simple sample normals, along with the current UV position because it's got to call this with something and a distance. And I'll show what this does. What it does is it calls our per noise function um, at all the places surrounding the UV. So let's say we have, oh no, I'm not in doodle mode. There we are. So here's our texels and we're generating the height for this point. What it does is it goes and samples our function. Oh yes, what comes after six, Chris? Another six! Right. It goes and samples at all the areas around and then it um, takes the differences in various directions. Oh, sorry. I'm looking at the wrong function. This is the, the one I was looking at. This one down here? This is the 3D one. We're not looking at this right now. We're looking at this guy. This is the one that samples all the points around. Calls the function a shit ton of times and then adds them and subtracts them together. So we get contributions and then we push that into a vector and normalize it. And that is how we get our normal vector. So on here, it like takes a point there and samples here and 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 it gets their contributions and we get like a little arrow at the end that looks like that. So that's, that's how we're getting our normal and and this is really nice, right? Because we can do it like we've got we've got lisps. So we just throw first class functions at the problem, and we let the compiler write the code. Um, so I think that's kind of cool. I mean, it's super lazy and expensive way of getting a normal. Meh. Five for us. Oh, let's get out of the eponymous doodle mode. But that's it. So I actually really like that. And the uh, 3D version can be used when if you're doing like a little simple ray tracer and you've got a uh, distance field like you can get the normal by doing the same thing sample above sample below sample over here 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 do some scaling normal that's my technical <laughs> description of how it's done okay so that's how we get the normal and that explains this position which is the position from each of the vertices we uploaded we go and sample our Perlin noise function our uh, this is this is now what's called a fractal noise because we're yeah adding multiple octaves together and apparently it's called fractal noise. That's that's that. It's self-similar at different levels. Yeah, that makes some kind of sense, I guess. And then what do we do? Okay, then we take our position and we right. This this is a little bit of magic now. So. When I once, once I had the compiler working, this was a while ago now. I was, it was cool, but it was also not. I mean, it's really nice to be able to write in this, but it wasn't technically better than any of the other compilers that existed. And so I want, I felt like, hey, this should be able to do something that you can't normally do with GLSL, and that was before I had first class functions. So I was kind of agonizing over it. And I was looking at what areas do I make a lot of mistakes? 
And one of the ones was I was always making mistakes with vector spaces. It was saying, hey, you need to go and find, um, like, what is it? You need to get the normal from world space and then, but this part of the computation needs it in camera space. And that used to mess with my head quite a bit. And I used to easily mix them up. I'd end up adding together a vector from one space with a vector from another space. And I wanted to stop that happening. So I made a graph of spaces, object on, this is not in the GPU, on the CPU side, we define a lot of objects and we are, and they are going to represent our spaces. So we'll have one for world space, we'll make ones, here's one that we made earlier, it was at the top up here. This one represents a model space. And then what you can do is you can get the, what is it? Um, get transform, yeah, between world space and model space. And it gives you a matrix. And I've defined model space to be exactly um, world space. So this is a very boring one at the moment. Let's see if I can find a more interesting space. If we'd say model space, to uh, the camera space. Was it called camera space? Oh, I can't remember my own function's name now. I am gonna end up wasting time if I just try and find that. So you have you have objects that represent spaces and then you can get the transform between them. And then what I wanted to be able to do was upload those to the GPU and then specify a block and say inside here, everything's happening in clip space. And then inside this one, everything's happening in model space. And then we have these special kind of vectors called spatial vectors. And they work just like normal vectors, except because I created it inside model space, this vector is in model space. And what happens then is this vector, because it's returned just like any other object in this, it leaves model space and goes into clip space. And the compiler then knows you have to add a conversion from model space to clip space. And this is all done automatically. So you get static checking of your vector space, like manipulations. You get static checking that you're not fucking up uh, your, yeah, Vector manipulation. So if I go pull G now, let's let's do pull G on height map play quad foot. Yeah. This is gonna be long because it's got hashing functions and it's got the quintic interpolation and it's got Perlin noise and our various functions. But down here in main, ah here we are, down here, you'll see that let's bring up the code again so we can actually compare it. Here we created a vector with position x, y, z and one. And we'll see that right here. Let's get the doodler out again. Right here. Oh yeah, draw over it. That's gonna help people see it. It's highlighted just under there. It creates that vector and it automatically multiplies it by the matrix four between model space and clip space. And what's more than that, it goes and adds um, a uniform to this. And you'll see that the model space to clip space matrix is a uniform that's automatically uploaded. So you just don't have to worry about it. You make vectors in certain spaces if you add if if you have two spatial vectors and they're inside the same scope they are in the same space if you create a vector a spatial vector out here and then you use it in here it will be converted into that vector space on the way in and it will be converted back out on the way out and so you just you can't screw it up and that was and that felt like a really cool feature it took a lot of messing around but that's what i'm able to do here now I'll just say, hey, this number, this is this vector, sorry, this is in model space. And then it will go into clip space um, and it will get transformed. And that's the value I then pass along to the fragment shader. And you can do this with normals as well. If the normal was coming from the mesh, we would do exactly the same thing here as here. But um, this normal we're calculating from the function. So it's already gonna be in the right space. 
so we don't need to do it. And then the fragment shader is super simple. All we're doing is we're dot producting some, we're saying the lights over there. And then we're dot producting our normal with that and we're saturating it so the value can't go below zero and we're multiplying it by this, which is our color. So, so like, it's a terrible color, it's, it is gray. But you know, we could do this and yay, the worst slimy terrain. But yeah, this is apparently, this is the, uh, the light color and the light is in quotation marks. I think colors are probably being quotation marks as well. And then this is um, ambient, so we can put too much ambient on things. We don't need any of that for now. It saves so much line of code. That sounds like sarcasm, my friend. No, it, it, it's, it's mainly time. I, when I got into ones where it's like, you need to do the lighting in view space, but we want to do the tra this other transformation in world space and they're right next to each other. It's, <laughs> it just abstracts all the noise away. Ah, oh, the domain of punners. There's puns everywhere. Right, anyway. It is the wrong year to be an enemy of the pun. Right, so yeah, we've got a little bit of code. It kind of looks like more than it is um, when we have such a big font, but it's 114 lines of code and we've got some nice rendering stuff going on over here. So what do we want to mess around with? Because that's basically like as much as I've thought through. We're just like, we'll do some Perlin noise. We kind of understand that now. Um, and we've got a terrain, which is using that noise and that's cool. Yeah, we're going to do geometry stuff, won't we? Right, I'm going to go find, rather than trust my memory, I'm just going to go up and look up Kaggle.examples, examples, and what is it called? Geom shader. And so what we're going to do is, yeah, we'll make a... still this and we're going to sit it up and try and draw the normals on this terrain so let's see how this goes the first thing we're going to need is we're going to need this stuff because that's how we get our original position and um, so let's just take this vertex shader and drop it down here and we'll start messing with it and the all the geometry shader is going to need this is going to be our geometry shader it's going to take the normals and it's going to emit um what is it doing here yeah it's generating generating lines wait a second i thought we only needed one line per thing what have we got here oh yeah of course geometry shader is going to get all three um, corners of the triangle. So we're going to draw a normal for each corner of the triangle. Yes. Let's do that. Um, that means we're not going to need the UV. We are totally fine with a very boring fragment shader. We just need to draw something. Um, we are going to take the same arguments as we had before. We're going to do the same transform on the position. We're going to pass the normal as is. I think we're fine with that now. Okay, so this is going to be a little geom vert. That's the vertex shader, which is practically the same. We're gonna go um, <laughs> with our current naming, this would be geom geom because I'm really thinking this through. Um, I'm not sure if we even need to change anything here. Okay, so what happens? The normals get passed in, but because this is a geometry shader, you're not working on individual points now, you're working on the entire primitive. And the primitive that's being passed in is a triangle. So we're gonna get a vector of three normals because we released one normal for each vertex in the vertex shader. So that's three normals coming in here. And then we're going to generate three lines and we're passing in the index 
Magnitude is going to be the length of our line. Uh, GL position is the position of the vertex that we're getting in. So we're going to get something like, say, this triangle here. We're going to get each corner. We're going to take the GL position. Then we're going to create a new, calculate a new position right here, which is the original position. Plus, yeah, the normal that we're interested in. Oh, that's dumb. Wait a second. I'm looking at, no, no. Yeah, that, that's fine. I'm looking at the normals array at this index. And the index is what we're passing in here. And yes, then we're setting that to be a vector four, which ends in zero because this is a direction and not a, not a position. We're multiplying it by the magnitude that we just specified here, and then we emit some geometry. So we're going to emit a vertex at the GL position, which is going to be cool. So that's going to be yeah at that corner. And then we're going to go and emit a vertex here, and that's going to join them together. And then we say n primitive, and that's cool. And at the top here, we have a declaration. It's just kind of normal kind of Lisp declaration, we're declaring the output primitive and we say that we're drawing a line and we're saying the max number of vertices is six because it's going to be two vertices for each corner of the triangle. So I think that might be it. So let's compile that and geomfrag is that. There we go, geomvert, geomgeom and geomfrag. And the first one takes GPNT, is that correct? Yes. And the second one takes an array of three vector threes, which is correct. And the last one takes Jack because it just passed along. So that's gonna be called draw normals. And then we are gonna go down to our frame. And in the same frame, we are going to, man, I hope this works. <laughs> We're gonna call draw normals. And we don't need to do anything else. Unknown key now. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, it was now used. Okay, the only uniform we need is model space. Okay, that's fine. Um, so we don't need any of these, apparently. Compile that again and say continue. Oh, yes! Thank crap for that. That would have been tedious. Oh no, it's gone. There we go. It's all right. It's my terrible camera. Oh, look at that aliasing. Oh, that is horrifying. Come on, get close enough that we can actually see what's going on. Look at all those normals. <laughs> They're all weird. Look at them. They're all pointing at a strange angle. Is that really the normals? They look strange, man. I think my normal calculation is wrong. This is why you visualize stuff. Oh, that's fun. Good call. Who is it that said we should do normals. Oh, Darius. Ball baggers. Good choice. Right, so where was that magnitude? Yeah, let's make that 0.4. All right. Man, I, I just have not been messing around with these much yet. Look at that. It's a simulation of wheat. For a person that's never seen wheat before. Oh man, that's cool. Boom. So basically, yeah, um, geometry shaders work. And so do tessellation. I, I can bring up, it's a much longer um, example. But in my Keppel examples repo, I do have a uh, tessellation example. And if we, okay. And there's similar kind of things. So we have a vertex shader, then we have a tessellation shader, and you declare, you just have to declare a few things. Basically, you just have to say, hey, the output patch from the uh, control, the tessellation control stage is this, this is how many vertices it's gonna have. 
And then in the tessellation eval, you have to declare what it's going to tessellate to. We're going to tessellate into triangles. The spacing is going to equal what order the things are tessellating at. Geometry shaders we've already seen. Uh, this one is using a geometry shader to um, give some data to the fragment shader so it can draw wireframes in one pass. It's really nice. Um, and then fragment shaders. And this is what a full GL pipeline looks like. You just say, here's vertex, here's control, here's eval, here's geometry, here's fragment. And the nice thing in Vario is because it knows, say, like we specify here, what the draw mode is going to be for this pipeline. And that means that as it's compiling these stages, it's gonna pass that information along. It's gonna go here, okay, so here we've got a patch. So when we pass in, we don't have to declare what kind of data is coming in. We only have to declare what kind of data is going out. And that's the same here. And it's, I think that's really cool. We can just, we can let the compiler do it. And not only does it do that, it checks for sanity. So it makes sure you're not doing anything ridiculous. Um, so yeah, that's that's where we are with um, geometry and tessellation. I've got I've got a bunch of bug fixes that I've been doing this month, which will be in the next uh, quick list release. So if you're using this and you run into any problems, ping me. There's a chance I've already fixed it, and if not, I can fix it pretty fast. All of this stuff is starting to work now, which is really good. So um, yeah, any more for any more. Is this the kind of thing you wanted to see, by the way, on the geometry shaders? Is I use this opportunity to pour various liquids, li liquids. I need coffee. Liquids into my head. And of course, if we get tired of seeing all these, we can just go down and. And turn them off. All right. Visuals are going to get more interesting as time goes on, and I make more stuff. Darius, couple, uh, amazing, couple never fails to amazing. Thank you so much. That's really cool. Um, I am so pleased that that example actually worked because I've done a couple, a couple of examples um, for testing, but they were other people's code. So, so it was just like, well, maybe this works. This looks like it works. But that was sweet. Oh, it's gonna be fun. We need to do it. Need to do some. We need to implement more things, and I guess we'll be doing that as the streams go on. We should try and do fur rendering one day as well, like fur rendering from seven years ago. Because that's what I'm going to do. This is this is graphics from 40 years ago, so <laughs> it will work forward. And eventually we'll have something that looks nice. Um... <laughs> oh, oh, more puns. Actually, you're joking about GoTo, but... Um... Common Lisp does have go-to. It does have blocks and it has structured jumping. So I looked into it, um, but, uh, but GLSL does not allow any kind of go-to, so which, which makes perfect sense, but uh, it was also a relief because it means I didn't have to implement it. So yeah. <laughs> there it is. Every time everyone's... Every time someone asks me why is Lisp so amazing, I'm just like, watch this. Lisp is a cool language. It's, and, and the fact it's still a cool language is impressive to me. Because um, it's been around for ages and not every, I mean, a bunch of good ideas have spread, which is awesome. We want that. Every language should be as good as possible. So for whatever its niche is, it should pull in as many ideas as it can. And there's still a few things that Common Lisp seems to do better than most other languages, or Lisps in general seem to do better than um, other languages. The thing that got me was I, I wrote the first version of the GLSL compiler without really knowing what a compiler was. And that was a big deal for me. It's like when you look up afterwards and see, oh, that's the name of the thing I was making. And it was stupid simple, right? Because I, what I saw was like, Say Lisp mode here. Okay. 
what I had was, I'm looking at code that looks like vec4123. And in Lisp, it's like vec4123. It's like there's, the, the, it's so easy to come up in your head how to transform the second thing to the first thing. And your code is already a data structure, like you can get at the data. So it becomes really trivial to like, okay, I'm gonna pass these things to a string format function that's gonna rename it. Like you're just gonna do format nil the name and then what is it gonna be? We would have this and then we would do, whoops, I can't type, this, this, this. Not pretty. Defun thing. X and we take the first of X and the rest of X. Compile that. Let's bring up the REPL again. Then we call thing with this. You know? And you start going, okay, like, really, how much work could this be? And I mean, I was stupid because it took me years of failure. Like, like a couple, it's been a, it, there's been bursts of activity and then dropping off again. It's been a lot recently. But, um, and you go, okay, that's uppercase. So we're just going to go straight and down case. Um, whoops. And then that kind of looks like what functions might be. And then... You can change this to anything, right? It's like, think of another GL function. Um, so we do floor with X, you know? Um, sorry, I mean, I'm off on a rant again. Someone said talk about this. <laughs> um, Emacs Live. Oh, Overtone. Yeah, man. Overtone is gorgeous. That's... Uh, that is such a cool system. There are so many cool languages for live coding, and I would, I would, I would just love to get more into them. But, but look at this. It's like when it's that easy. Like, oh man, this just makes me want to do the first version again. Like, let's just do this. We're gonna do def macro compile, okay? And we're gonna take um, a name, and we're gonna take args. And I'm gonna make this font slightly smaller, and we're gonna take a body. You're gonna to have to put up with me doing this now because I'm, I'm, I'm stoked. Right, so what are we gonna emit? We're gonna emit, um, say nil, we're gonna go the name and then we're gonna do the arg somehow. Let's do that like, oh, it's the same as our function call basically. So we're gonna do this and then we're gonna open paren and close paren and in the middle, Let's do this on new lines. In the middle, we're going to have some code. So we're going to do body, right? Ah, commonless package violated. Oh yeah, called something compile. Compile GLSL. That's not going to be taken. Fuck you. Right, abort. What's not being used? Name is not defined. Oh yeah, so we're going to do name is not being used. So we do this. What's format complaining about? Too many arguments to this. So we're going to do that. Undefined variable args. Okay. So now we can say compile GLSL main x, y, z, and then plus, we'll just do, yeah, we'll do vec3 x, y, z. Let's prove a point. Okay, so the first part is done now. We've got a main and we've got some stuff. Let's uh, string down case just like we did before to get that. And now this bit is still Lisp, so we need to fix that. And there should be a new line here as well. Um, but yeah, that's... Oh yeah, and it's main, so it should have void before it. Um, and then what we're going to do, we're going to take the code and we're going to recursively call thing on it. So how is that going to look? Um, Defun foo for now, because whatever. Um, it's going to be a list. And oh yeah, let's just use this because we've already got this thing. So we're going to take first and then we're going to do this, but we're going to map car 
thing over it, and we do thing on the body, and then we do that, and that's not quite right. What is it? What's wrong about it? Oh yeah, because body, we just do map car here over thing body, and x is not list because yes, go um, type case of x. And if it's a list, then we'll do this. And otherwise, we'll just return it as it is. And that's already starting to look like code. Uh, what else do we need to do? Oh yeah, we need to... Let's make that a bit smaller again. You know... <laughs> And then we can we can nest this as well, so we can say vec two one two. Like that is what I did a few years ago, and it wasn't that this is a good way of writing a compiler. It's the fact that from yeah, I guess we've lost baggers. I'm off now. Like it was the fact that we could in in two minutes you can sketch out a couple of functions, and you can imagine going from one language to the other. And it was that simple, and that's how, like, it, everything felt so iterative, and that was beautiful. Right. I, sh I shouldn't be allowed to, to broadcast my thoughts. Anyway, right. <laughs> oh, yeah, the concert programmer. That was cool. That's pretty awesome. <laughs> Not a bit. So, yeah. And this, this thing just starts becoming addictive, though, because, like, if I just jump back over here, you start seeing little things that niggle you. It's like, oh, maybe maybe it needs indentation. And we need, we need semicolons that line ends. So each of these should... Does it... Like, what happens if we do this? <laughs> it's so silly. Except return, and this is where the first problem you run into, oh, return's not a function call. So can I structure it like this? Maybe if I put a space there, and then it would be legal, because then it would just be parens around a thing. Like you start messing, oh, it's fun. And then, and then eventually you're streaming Lisp, and, and, and you're very hairy. Right, enough of that. Good God, man. Right. I don't think I should be allowed to talk anymore. So unless you know, have any specific questions or topics we could play around with quickly, I think we'll call it a day. Next week, um, I'm going to be doing, rather than a tear apart a function video, we're going to do a general Keppel Lisp kind of video. So if you have questions or stuff you'd like to see, Email me. My email is on my GitHub account, or ping a message to me on Twitter, or leave a message on the YouTube video, or leave a message here, or whatever. I will maybe not here. I don't know how good the Twitch chat is. Like every time I revisit, it's all gone. So maybe not here. But like all of the other places, um, ping me questions. I've had uh, already had questions on basically how Keppel is structured, how everything holds together, things about different platforms. Um, we'll start there and we'll work onwards but I would really love to know what you guys want to see um, thank you so much for turning up um, this is it, it's great fun for me and I'm, I really hope that this is a, a bit of a kick for you guys as well um, yeah thank you so much for joining me and I, I guess I'll see you next week I think we'll, I'll give you a second to ask questions before I bugger off but I, I think that, I think that's it Oh yeah, Reddit, perfect place to reach me. Uh, get onto the uh, Lisp subreddit and uh, or come down to the Lisp Games IRC room, channel, whatever. Because it's great. There's some lovely folks there and they're smarter than me. <laughs> oh, it's good. Cool. Okay, this seems like a good place to wrap it up. Once again, cheers guys. I, I will see you all next week. Ciao.